Okay, sorry you can't see me, I'm driving at night. Um, so, I've got a few directions I need to go um, with respect to the whole handling of James. And as I said, there's like three major ways that people do mental gymnastics to accommodate James, assuming that his epistle is inspired. The uh, first is to redefine justification um, and say that when James is talking about justification, he's talking about justification before men. Um, and I'll have to deal with that in another uh, video. And it gets down to James and Paul and you kind of have to accumulate what they said about Abraham and justification and how it occurred and you notice there's a distinction between the two of them and it's about timing and Paul especially stresses he asked the question again and again when was Abraham circumcised I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm tired when was Abraham justified and he establishes a timing that's very important to understand the nature of justification in the Old Testament for Old Testament saints, okay? So these people will say, so so he, so he differs from James uh, because the timing is completely different. Um, and what we see in James's model of justification is, you know, he calls it faith perfected by works. Um, it would be fine to say that, no, faith can't be perfected by works. Sorry. Faith always comes through the hearing of faith. And Paul is so clear about that. Um, faith comes by the word of God, the word of faith. And he talks about in Galatians, how the word, the scripture spoke to Abraham. You know, there was no scripture in Abraham's time, but Abraham kept having visitations of the God of glory. Stephen talks about that, that the, that the God of glory appeared to Abraham and Abraham kept getting stuck and couldn't move forward until the word appeared to him again. And the word was a person. So you can go through Abraham's life and look at the theophanies, the times that the pre-incarnated Christ appeared to him and urged him on by preaching the promise again and elaborating on that promise to bless his seed. Every time he got stuck, whether it was he was stuck because he thought a lazy art was going to be the heir, or he was stuck because he had Ishmael, you know, or he was stuck in the beginning because he wouldn't leave his father's house, or he dragged his whole father's house with him and parked in Haran before he went, actually crossed over. All of that, he needed visitations from God to move him forward. So the faith was imparted to him in those visitations because faith is not perfected through anything we do, but faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. And Abraham had the word of God preaching directly to him. And Galatians, interestingly, calls it the gospel that was preached before to Abraham and says that the scripture preached it to him. It's just kind of an interesting set of words in Galatians 3, and that comes from the Galatians study I'm doing, uh, if you're interested in that. But anyway, so those who say that justification before men is what James has in view are trying to assuming that the epistle is totally inspired, revelation inspired means revelation, inspired doesn't mean spiritual, it means it's revealed truth from God, okay so it's really, you have to watch when you say inspired because Paul's writings were inspired his writings were his body of revelation that he received directly from the ascended Christ. 
James, where would he have gotten his truth from? You know, when you get into James, you have to go, where did this guy come from? Yes, he was Jesus' brother. So maybe he was taught by Jesus during their earth life before Jesus' ministry. But once Jesus' ministry start, James was not part of the crowd that sat at the feet of Jesus. Now, Jesus did appear to him in the same window that he appeared to those other disciples after his resurrection, showing them proofs that he was alive and opening up the Old Testament scriptures to show that he was the one who had fulfilled the prophets. That's what it says he did. When he showed himself to those disciples during that 40-day period between John 20 and Acts 2, he kept just proving that he was the one who fulfilled the scriptures and that he was made alive, resurrected, okay? And I believe he was teaching them about his invisible presence um, by appearing and disappearing and letting them feel the warmth in their heart while he spoke the word and uh, just various means he used to keep showing them that he's with them. And that's why I believe, one of the reasons I believe that they were born again already and that the church uh, move in Acts 2, the clothing of power that came down upon them, that was not them being born again. That was them receiving an equipping of power for the preaching of the gospel so that God could raise up the church, um, which he did. And then in Acts, we see people being born again and receiving the Holy Spirit as a clothing of power at the same time. Fine. Does it always happen that way? Not necessarily. There's many, there's one baptism, there's many fillings. <laughs> so anyway, uh, James would have been part of that group. That doesn't mean he received some kind of special revelation. What we see with that group is that they all continued to stumble forward with a mix of their own, the teachings of Jesus that 12 of them had received directly, and the then their own concepts that they kept inserting into their understanding of those teachings from their background in Judaism. And that's why they did not understand when the Gentiles got started getting saved. And we don't even see them getting saved until in a you know dramatic way until Acts 10 which is nearly 10 years after the Lord resurrected and when they did have gentiles getting saved they persecuted Peter for going and eating with them you know he went to Cornelius's house comes back with this glorious testimony that the spirit had been poured out on them just like on the Jews in Jerusalem and they did eventually conclude, the elders did, okay, then the Gentiles can be are getting saved. But first they persecuted Jay, uh, Peter for eating with them. And that persecution persisted from the circumcision party. And it's one of the reasons why he left Jerusalem and ended up taking refuge in Antioch. And it's why he was afraid of them when they came down to Antioch and stopped eating with the Gentiles. The same issue had not been resolved. They were still pushing him about that. The Jews could not accommodate Gentiles being saved. And the Acts 15 conference was all about that. And Paul finally came and preached the revelation he had received from the ascended Christ, which was his gospel, and shared it with the apostles and James in Jerusalem. And what, what does it say? There was much disputation again. Acts 10, Acts 15, we see this arguing. They are not clear. James, for some reason, is presiding over that meeting, which makes absolutely no sense. Peter, but Peter had been, Peter's influence had declined and he'd been overrun by these circumcised people who surrounded James. And James was quite comfortable to be in that position, as far as we can tell. And they exalted him as a leader, like I said, likely because he was next in line for the throne of David. And there were false believers in there, according to Paul, false brethren, spying out the liberty and trying to bring people into bondage who wanted that kind of king. They knew Jesus, who had, in their view had died. They didn't believe he rose from the dead. 
they knew he was now they now knew he was of the house of David and was heir to the throne so James would have been next in line so of course they're going to try to use them use him for their messianic purposes or their Zionistic purposes and James may or may not have been aware of that we don't see James having a lot of sense of the spirit though because he misinterprets Amos in his speech in Acts 15 which we'll have to look at a little later but because I don't have it in front of me but basically he says yeah it's okay. the Gentiles will get saved because Amos says God's gonna raise again the tabernacle of David and the Gentiles will come you know uh, that prophecy applies to the millennium when Israel is in the land and they are being ruled by their resurrected king and at that time, the Gentile nations, who are not part of the church, but those remnant of those who survived the tribulation go in to populate the millennium, will come to Israel to learn of God's ways. They'll come to Zion because that's where the king will be. And that's why it says the law will go forth from Zion. During that time, it'll be a glorious period of Israel's exaltation. James preaches from that to try to define the Gentiles being saved, which means he did not understand whatever Paul told them about the church, this body of Christ in which there's no Jew or Greek, but Christ is all in all and God has a new program. And yes, Paul knew that at that time because he'd already, yes, so he, you know, he, so that was part of his gospel that he was preaching. And James basically settles the conference as the leader and comes up with a compromise where we won't put these certain burdens on the Gentiles but it's okay because they're going to hear Moses preached in the synagogue week after week. So that's his view is look, they're going to become Jewish one way or another and he is looking at the whole situation in the light of the exaltation of Israel and he's blind to the reality of the church and that blindness persists because in Acts 21, when, Jer when Paul is going to Jerusalem, he is continually confronted by prophets who, by the Spirit, tell him he's going to be bound and delivered over to the, first the Jews and then the Gentiles. And he was fine to do that, just as Jesus went as a sacrificial lamb deliberately to Jerusalem, so did Paul. They knew what they were going to get into. They knew the spiritual dynamic, and they knew what they were going to trigger. Jesus knew what he was going to trigger, and so did Paul. And they set their face to go. Because everything has to play out, and everybody has to be exposed. That's what even uh, the prophets prophesied to Mary about Jesus, that he would be... Um, he would, he would pierce her heart too, but he would be for a an ensign that would expose every man's heart, right? Because when he was crucified, it clearly exposed those Jews who said, yes, his blood be on our head. We have no king but Caesar. He triggered that by going into Jerusalem and just pressing forward to bring, because whenever the light comes, the darkness that's in men is manifested in that light. So that's, by the way, one of the reasons why the church should be expecting to be persecuted if she goes into revival, because when she is full of light, people who are full of darkness, their nature will truly be revealed, and they will act on impulses that will surprise them, like Cain and Abel, right? Cain didn't think he was going to kill Abel, but God warned him that sin was dwelling in his nature and would overpower him. And Abel kept persisting in the testimony of Jesus Christ and the blood and the offering and showing by the joy he had probably about his acceptance because they knew whether their offering was accepted. Cain knew his was rejected. Abel knew his was uh, accepted. And, one, and Cain's countenance fell, but Abel's would have been a smiling countenance, right? And that brought out the darkness in Cain's nature. Well, that's what Jesus did when he went to Jerusalem, was he brought it all to a head. And that's what Paul was doing when he went to Jerusalem in Acts 21 by revelation again. 
he knew what was operating there and he went to trigger the trap because he knew it would bring him to Rome eventually, right? The victory of the New Testament is that Paul is saying in Philippians, those in Caesar's household greet you. The gospel went all the way to Rome. That was his heart. And he knew by revelation that if he went to Jerusalem, there was a trap waiting for him that would get him in a situation where he would be brought into a place where he could preach the gospel in Rome, even though he was going to be in chains. All the prophets along the road told him he'd be in chains, tried to persuade him not to go with their natural man, even though they prophesied that. And he said, no, I know I'm constrained in spirit to go. And when he gets there, he goes and meets with James. And James is the one who tells him, look, uh, we've got all these Jews, thousands of them, myriads of them who believe that Jesus, but they are zealous for the law. Now take some men and go in and take a vow and um, offer purification rites so that you could show them you have not apostatized from Moses. So that is James fully rejecting all, it, whether he knew it, everything Paul had said about Moses. I mean, whether it was in the book of Romans or whether it was the book of 2 Corinthians, the, 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 all the truth that, that he had revealed about the fact that we are not at Sinai, but we are now in uh, Zion with the heavenly ministry of Christ and it's a new dispensation and we are not tethered to Jerusalem and Moses but we now have Christ right grace and truth has come through Christ and we must turn to him and, and turn away from the old even though it was true for its time and all of his truth about justification and how it occurred in the Old Testament by faith and never by works or a mix of faith and works and James had rejected all that and said, now you show everybody that you have not apostatized from Moses. And what Paul did was he took some Greeks and made them take the vow too. Because it was like, okay, well, if, the, if it's good for the Jews, it'll be good for the Greeks because we're for one body. But he also knew that that would stir up controversy. Remember, Paul was a master at these kind of tactics because in that one chapter in Acts, when he was arrested, uh, you know, he said he, he knew he was in a room full of Sadducees and Pharisees in front of uh, uh, the Roman guy. Sorry, I don't, I'm, I don't have Acts in front of me. But he says, you know, men and brethren, I'm called here today for the testimony of the resurrection from the dead. And that started a huge, they all started arguing and broke out in arguments and the whole situation became riotous and the, it was clear that the Jews were out of control and Paul wanted to show that Paul wanted that to happen and knew his he knew exactly how to trigger that stuff and so when he took those Greeks into the temple he knew what he was doing he knew he wasn't gonna go take a vow he knew that there would be a riot and sure enough there was a riot and that's what brought an end to his public ministry and James orchestrated the whole thing and it was a trap whether James knew it was a trap or not doesn't even matter it was a trap so when you see all that that James was instrumental in bringing an end to Paul's ministry his public ministry and you see how he stood with Jerusalem and stood with the temple and rejected the new the body of truth that Paul had to bring. How can you say his epistle is inspired? Why didn't he have the same sense that those prophets had? Hey, you know, if you come here, the, why didn't the Holy Spirit tell him? You know, the Holy Spirit told all those prophets and warned Paul. And yet, James just pursued uh, his course insensitive if he had to the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit was you don't see him responding to the Holy Spirit in that okay now so we'll get into James and Paul's view of justification which really centers if, if you, you just have to collect everything they said about Abraham but in order to accommodate James and 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 hold on to the assumption that his epistle is inspired, people have either tried to redefine justification or try to redefine Paul's w words and make faith and give it a different definition and that's what the Roman Catholics did and the Reformed Calvinists and 
John McCarthy and those guys do. They say they basically make faith into a work by giving James's definition to it. Or the next one is they cut the Bible up. Uh, or, you know, they reject Paul, but then the, the, the dispensationalists cut the Bible up. And I'm a dispensationalist. But I don't agree with this. Yes, Peter and John were given uh, the commission in Acts 15, or it was decided that they would go to the circumcision. But they didn't go with a different gospel than Paul did. They preached grace. Peter's words are fully grace, justification by faith. He was corrected in uh, Antioch, and in Jerusalem, he was clear. And in Acts 15, he spoke up on Paul's behalf and made it clear that Jews had to be the same, same, the same way Gentiles, which is by faith. Peter said that in that meeting, real clearly. And John, we know, wrote the book of John and his epistles, which are built on Pauline revelation. So they were fully in agreement. They didn't have one gospel to the circumcision and another gospel to the Gentiles. Okay? People assume that because they went to the Jews and Paul went to the Gentiles, they must have been preaching something totally different. No. And maybe there was a different kind of language used. Like we see a slightly more uh, temple-centered language in John and Peter because that was the background of the people that they were talking to and Paul was talking to Gentiles who didn't have that background but the truth they communicated is the same but James doesn't belong in any of that he his epistle it is not Christ centered theirs is Christ centered his is not Christ centered it's law centered okay and so, so anyway, they try to cut the Bible up and say, well, James through Hebrews are, and Peter are for the tribulation and Paul's writings with the church. And they do this huge bludgeoning, which is totally insensitive and unnuanced, in order to accommodate James. That's the reason they do it. And because there's verses in Hebrews that they don't have a nuanced way to handle that seem to indicate you could fall away from the faith, which actually it's a misinterpretation of those verses anyway, and it's a misunderstanding of what the book of Hebrews is about. So James has to be handled as a separate book, but Hebrews is a church book even though it's very Levitically oriented because it is a comparison of the superiority of Christ over everything that went before given by Moses. And it was to convince Jews, okay? It was written to those who had a Jewish background, but it introduces them to church truth, not truth that will apply in the millennium because it talks about Christ being the firstborn and when he's raised from the dead, he, pre he presents himself as I and the many children that you have given to me. And you see in the book of Hebrews that he is the captain of our salvation to bring many sons to glory. That is church. Our inheritance is to be glorified with Christ. That is a higher uh, inheritance than the inheritance of the land in Israel. Even though there will be a resurrection, those who go through the tribulation and enter as Jews will not be glorified the way the church is. They are not in the same sense uh, with the same inheritance. It's a different setup. Okay, number one. So, like I said, Hebrews does dis dis distinguish Christ from everything that went before from Moses, but it is to bring Jews into church truth so that they would leave that old temple system behind. 
And that is for first century Jews, and it applies to us. You know, without Hebrews, I don't see how you have a revelation of the high priestly ministry of Christ. There is a heavenly ministry of Christ revealed in Hebrews that is absolutely essential. And it is paired with, I already did the study of the contrast between Sinai and Zion, you know, that's presented in Galatians, Romans, 2 Corinthians, and Hebrews. That is a group. That's a set. If you look at what's in it and how it compares to some, internally to some of these other books, you can see that the audience is the same. In Hebrews, we're not in earthly Jerusalem, but we are in Zion above, and we have come to Zion with the, in the city of the living God, right? The heavenly city. That is a church thing. Uh and I wish I had Hebrews in front of me so I could really get into that. And, and I hope to eventually do a study of Hebrews. But the other thing is they say it's a tribulation book. Okay, so they say James is a tribulation book and Hebrews is a tribulation book. This is a bludgeoning of the scriptures to accommodate James, okay? Well, first of all, in the tribulation, or maybe it's second of all, in the tribulation, Jews are going to be running. They're going to be fleeing to the mountains. They're not going to need a long, lengthy, complicated, and nuanced Bible study to search out the differences between Christ and the Mosaic system. See, the early church Jews were steeped in Levitical Judaism, and that's their whole environment was based on that. So it had to be broken down, and there had to be many arguments for that in order to, for that to happen. And it takes years to get through Hebrews and really understand it. So in the time of the tribulation, events are going to be happening so fast. There's going to be the witness of the 144,000 and the two witnesses. Nobody in Israel who's a real Jew who is part of that remnant is going to need to sit down and read a book like Hebrews to know that the Antichrist going into the temple is and declaring himself to be God is nothing to do with their them and they need to run. They're going to know to run. And when they're running, they're not going to have a book like Hebrews open, you know, in front of them trying to figure it out. They're just going to be running and they're going to have plenty of testimony and reason to do so. You know, actually, if anything, the, the dispensationalists right now, because of the way they're handling this and saying that during the tribulation, it's going to be a mix of faith and works, they're actually undermining the gospel of grace that the people in the tribulation are going to need to lay hold of in order to endure. So be very careful. What kind of legacy are you planning on leaving these people? Are you going to write a left behind letters? Not that I'm for left behind letters, but are you going to write one of these letters and tell them, Hey, you could fall away from your faith. You could fall away because you know, faith without works is dead. And even the demons believe in Trump. Really? You're going to do that to them? No, they have. And we'll talk about this when we get to Paul and James's view on justification and what Paul talks and says about justification that applies to every age. Justification is the same through every age. And like I said, faith comes by hearing by, in the word of God, hearing by the word of God, and faith is a gift from God. And that faith will preserve you once you have it. Okay? And yeah, so anyway, no, they're not going to be reading the book of Hebrews. And the, for the letters to the seven churches are not for tribulation saints, nor is the letter to James, that James wrote to the Jews, because they're not going to have orderly assemblies during this time of persecution, unlike any other time in the whole history of the world. They're not going to be sitting there needing admonition about how to treat poor people and, you know, uh, everything James is talking to, he's talking about an orderly environment in a synagogue. There's gonna, it's not gonna be like that. The ones who are attending synagogue will be false Jews. They're not gonna be the the saved remnant. Those people are gonna be kicked out of the synagogues. They're not gonna be meeting in the synagogues. So 
no, it's not appropriate in my mind to just because John and James or John and Peter were given to go to the circumcision and yes, they wrote their own epistles to say that because they wrote to Jews that were in the diaspora and addressed them. Well, John didn't, but Peter did. Uh, to say that this is for the tribulation. Sorry. It's just not... Now, Peter was writing with first century sufferings in mind, and so did James. And I'm not saying that James's epistle is bad, but it's not revelation. And it's... And James too can't the his model of justification cannot be applied in any age paul tells us that very clearly he argues against it very clearly so it's amazing to the lengths that people have gone to to try to accommodate james because they assume his epistle is inspired and that is a kind of veil. The only way I can see it is that there is a blindness about James. It, it's like he, we're bewitched. We think that because it's in the Bible, it's inspired. Well, then Job's his friends, what they said was recorded. Is it inspired? You know? So just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean those words are inspired, although the Holy Spirit did arrange for it to be there as a record. So there's some things that are a record that are not necessarily inspired, but are for you that have discernment to see. Look at the background. Look at the struggle that was present, that the gospel of grace was... Look, look at this environment that the gospel of grace was born into and had to fight against because you're still dealing with it today. All through church history, this matter is being dealt with again and again and again and again. So, uh, okay, this is a little long, but Hebrews, I still haven't really gotten to address it the way I wanted to. I think these messages, I mean, this is not the only thing I want to talk about right now, but the, the Hebrews is not a tribulation letter, okay? That period of time, they're not going to need a sophisticated argument to see that the temple needs to be, that they need to turn from temp Levitical Judaism because they're not steeped in it. The Jews in Israel are not steeped in temple Judaism. They haven't been conditioned that way. They've, they've got a Judaism that has no temple. Now there is this you know, the Temple Institute and the priests and stuff like that that are reintroducing it, but people aren't so saturated with it that it'll be hard for them to turn from, especially since it, within probably three and a half years after it's erected, the Antichrist is going to walk in and declare he's going to be God, and the Jews are going to know it, those are the, who are of the remnant, and run. They'll know to flee. They're not going to sit down and read the book of Hebrews and think about it. They're going to run. And while they're running, they can't read. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later.